This is the copy of the book. It's called This is Leadership. Uh, it's about to be published on May 17. And uh, I've written this book some time ago, but I thought maybe this is the right time to release it. Yeah. Now that now that we have a serious problem with leadership in the world. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to reading this copy. Yeah, it's a bit controversial. You can see the subtitle. It says, "This is this is this is the prototype. It's not uh, it's not the final one. It's the final one, but it's the one that's not the one that will be released." It says, "You think you know leadership? Think again." And 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 it says here. This book may be controversial. So the, so the purpose of this book is to, um, to take leadership back to its roots, uh, to its core meaning, and, uh, and to remove uh, much of the declutter that has accumulated around the concept of leadership over time. Because over the past 20 or 30 years, it has become uh, more or less, uh, or to a great extent, commercialized. So everything has been loaded into this term. So this attempt is to remove the clutter. It is full of uh, illustrations. It's full of illustrations. So, uh, and, and it's, it's made of short subjects to talk about what leadership is and what leadership is not. So I hope this book will uh, set things, will present at least my view of leadership and contribute to the discourse and enrich the conversation about this very important subject. That is great. Well, I think it's time now to start the session. So <coughs> hi, everyone. Um, I think you've been entertained by our pre-session notes. Um, welcome to Leading Through and Beyond COVID-19 with my guest speaker, Michael Foley. My name is Siva Messi. Uh, on behalf of the University of Manchester Middle East Center, I would like to welcome you all and thank you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, I'm very delighted to be joined by our guest speaker, Michael Cooley. For those who don't know Michael, Michael is the author of 10 books on leadership and strategy. He has studied at Harvard, Princeton, Maastricht, and the American University of Beirut. He started his career as a war journalist with Reuters and became later the president of Reuters Middle East and the CEO of Orbit Television Network. Michael is a World Bank Fellow and is currently the president of Cambridge Institute for Global Leadership and of Cooley Institute, a think tank for executive learning. Michael's philanthropic work includes being a board member and a chairman of a number of regional leadership academies in Asia, the Middle East, and Eurasia. He is a global thinker, a professional speaker, advisor to boards of directors, and heads of states. Michael has trained thousands of top executives and senior officials. His purpose is to develop the leadership capacity of people so they can bring light and prosperity to themselves, their families, organizations, communities, and to the entire world. We saw his upcoming book, This is Leadership, Taking Leadership Back to Its Core. All Michael's books are available on Amazon. Michael, we are very delighted to have you with us today discussing leadership at this time with, with the COVID-19 outbreak, which is an unprecedented situation for everyone, for our societies, but especially for governments, for companies, for business leaders, who are expected and should respond promptly and with urgency. And um, perhaps this is, or maybe for sure, it's a time for leaders to step up and do what's right to protect their people um, in companies, uh, to protect their customers, and uh, to leaders to think about their companies. How do you think leaders are preparing to respond to the current situation? Well, hello everybody. Um, thank you all for being part of this talk. Thank you, University of Manchester, for the invitation. And thank you, Hiba and team, for organizing this event. 
Uh, in the context of um, such a webinar or such a online talk, um, it's hard to know the nature of the audience that is behind this global network of the internet. So people might be from the public sector, the private sector, uh, NGOs, professionals, uh, people from the academia. Um, so what I'm going to do, considering this reality, is I'm going to have a wide angle approach that will cover from a high altitude the subject of leadership in the context of this ex these exceptional times that we're going through. And then I'm going to zoom in to talk more about um, self-leadership. Self-leadership not in the sense of self-help, but in the sense of what you, you and I, each one of us, regardless of the background of your industry, can do to adapt to this new reality. So I would encourage you to stay with us till the end because the part of the self-leadership will be a main part and I purposely did that because it goes across the board regardless of your particular interest. I will start with the context to begin with. A few weeks ago we were uh, all taken by surprise by this pan pandemic that shook the entire planet. So we started uh, with the denial phase, even the WHO was in denial, thinking that this was uh, a situation that's limited to China at the time. Um, then we went from the denial phase into the shock phase, especially after we saw the magnitude and the scope of what, has, what is being, um, how, how the world is being transformed. And now, I believe, now we are at a different stage. I think we are almost into the acceptance phase. We have accepted that this has really happened. It's part of our current reality. And now we're getting used to it at different levels because each one of us has his own way of getting used to changes. And now I believe we're starting also to go into the phase where we're going out. We're starting to prepare to go out. Um, gradually the lockdown are, uh, rules are being eased and people more and more are talking, especially governments, about you know, going back to, to work. Um, I'm going to use an, an analogy to explain where we are now. Just imagine that the entire you know, world community was sitting in their you know, living room watching TV, having a good time because things were stable, the global economy was booming. In general, things were going fine, especially after New Year's. And suddenly you hear this strong wind, you know, blowing. And then you discover that this wind actually has immediately turned into a hurricane. So what do we do? We all rush to the bunkers and we hide. All this happening very quickly. And while we're hiding, we're just getting to grips with this new reality. This is becoming a bigger and bigger and a stronger hurricane that is really shaking the foundation of our home. And now the hurricane seems to be passing. It hasn't passed completely, but it's passing. And soon we'll get out of our bunkers, go out to discover what has happened. Um, I'm sure some of you remember the footage that TVs broadcast from an altitude showing cities and towns that have been devastated after a hurricane has passed. Uh, of course, it's not an accurate analogy, but you get the point. So people come out from their bunkers to look around and see what is left standing and what has been destroyed and to come to grips with this new reality. I think we are at this stage now. We're about to leave our bunkers to get out and see what has really happened and how, how our world has, has changed. Um, so these are the main questions that we're going to be asking soon. We're going to be asking, what did just happen to us? We're going to ask, be asking what is the extent of the damage that happened to all aspects of our, um, of our life. We're going to be asking about what is the nature of, of our new reality. We're going to be asking about um, how, our, how did this change our priorities? Are our priorities still the same or are they different? Are they going to be different from now, are going to change the order of our priority. 
Um, where, where, where would safety fit from now on? How would be the dynamic and the tension between the issue of safety versus privacy and issues of liberty? How are we going to handle the trends of you know, tribal thinking, tribalism, everybody thinking on their own, everybody thinking about their own close tribe, whatever defines their identity in society, versus thinking at a national level, versus thinking in terms of global community. So all of these questions uh, will come to the surface. And one of the main questions that will come to the surface now is, what went, what went wrong? Um, what did really, what happened so that we ended up in this situation? And we need to ask these questions to be to get uh, to get more familiar with the new reality that we're going to be living with, and also to learn from what happened and uh, make sure that we don't repeat all these mistakes. So the answer to these questions, to answer these questions, the top questions from a leadership perspective, in my personal view, COVID-19 did not just expose a health problem. Of course. It is a major, major global health challenge. There's no question about that. But I think this is the facade. I think what it actually exposed it, uh, is a much bigger problem that we should think about. And that is the problem of the absence of proper leadership. So the issue here that I want to do is I want to frame what we're facing beyond just a health challenge. And we should to take it deeper than this, because the health challenge is a manifestation of the leadership failure, the leadership crisis that we are dealing with now. And if you want to take it even into to a deeper level, the health challenge now uh, is not just a manifestation of failure of leadership, but also a manifestation of uh, the value system that we have. Because what is leadership? Leadership uh, is an expression of the values that we believe in because when we exercise leadership and the way we exercise it it determines or it shows it manifests what matters to us most most what what we care more most about so all of these at these three dimensions the health dimension then going deeper into the leadership dimension and then going into the value dimension that underline what we really care about is all part of the bigger frame that we should consider when we look at a problem like this. Now, I don't want to go into the values issue because that's another conversation. And I don't want to, be, uh, to, to, be, to remain in the health issue because we have been talking about this for a long time and it's already, it has been a material in the media and you already know about this, you know, from social media and from hearing the news. I'm going to frame this as a leadership challenge. And I think that this is a deeper and more worrying problem than just the health problem, although the health problem is substantial, of course, because people are dying. So why is this a deeper problem than the health problem? For a simple reason. Would you trust this approach of leadership? I'm not talking about quote-unquote leaders because I don't want to personalize this. This is not a blame situation. Let's talk about the approach of leadership. Would you trust this approach of leadership going into the future, especially when we're talking about this level of danger? Let's assume tomorrow we wake up to some new breaking news saying that a big rock, a huge rock, you know, an asteroid, an asteroid is approaching Earth and there's a high probability that it's going to hit planet Earth. Now, you might think that Okay, this is like a Hollywood movie and it's not possible, but scientifically it's possible. Maybe it's not probable on the short term, but eventually we all know that it's possible. These things happen in the universe. Anyway, I'm using this as an analogy to another global risk, global danger that's going, that is going to be facing humanity as a whole. So the question is, would you trust the current approach of leadership that handled the issue of COVID-19 to deal with a similar global danger that could shake entire humanity? I think the answer is most probably, at least for many people, will be not much because um, uh, there might have been some bright sides in the way this has been handled, but there's so much to be learned and so much is left to be promised in the way this has been approached. So my concern is that 
it believe, I believe that, in my view, it's risky to go into the 21st century with all the problems that it will present with this level of leadership. That's why I'm saying this is a much bigger issue than COVID-19, because if we go into the 21st century, we're still 20 years into this century, and who knows what the future is hiding. If we go with this level of leadership, then we really have to ask ourselves if this is the smartest thing to do. I mean, I look at this mess. It will take us years and years to recover from this mega problem that has happened. Provided, of course, there's no new problems that are going to appear in the next few months or the next few years as we try to recover from, from this. So much of this, if not all, could have been avoided, I think. Now, while saying that, I want to also highlight that we have to approach this with compassion because all of this is new. Nobody was prepared. So it's easy now to point at people and say, this person was late, this government did not react in an ideal way, you know, uh, this, this organization uh, was not optimal. It's very easy to say that in hindsight. But while we can say that and it's justified, we have to also keep in mind that nobody is prepared, has been prepared for this. Maybe we should have. Maybe we should have read the signals. Maybe we should have listened to the scientists. Maybe we should have listened to the activists who have been talking over, you know, for years that we have to be prepared for, for what happened, especially after SARS and Mars and, you know, HIV and, and uh, the other disease, Ebola and other diseases. But regardless, I think it's important to introduce the element of compassion because we don't want to personalize this. We don't want to make it into a negative issue. We want to remain, keep it in the realm of how do we learn from this sort from here we can move forward. But still, having said that, I believe that we could do much better than what we have done. As humanity, we could do much better. And that this mess is a direct consequence of the lack of capable leadership and not of a microscopic virus. Now, why is this a major leadership failure? Because problems are not an exception to life. Problems are not the exception. If you are in a leadership, context, if you're exercising leadership or in a position of authority, you know this for a fact. Problems are not the exception. Problems are the norm. Every day you wake up with, you know, problems and crisis. So this is the norm. And therefore, it is the responsibility of leadership to protect us from these kinds of developments, from this kind of danger. Otherwise, what's the point? If, it, if leadership does not look forward, if does not preempt, if does not think long term, if does not listen, if does not assume, you know, worst case scenario, if it's not prepared, then what's the point? Because if I make a mistake, then maybe I will pay the price and people around me will pay the price. But if people in power, people in position of authority, people who are assuming responsibility on behalf of entire communities make mistakes, then the entire community pays the price. So that's why it's a valid point uh, to make. And what makes this more obvious is that we are not in the Middle Ages. Well, this is not the 16th century. This is not the 15th century. This is not even the you know, 19th century or the early 20th century. We are not there. We are at the beginning, or maybe we're 20 percent into into the into the, the 21st century. So what? And, and we, the world is different now. Um, um, the fact is that we have an immense amount of knowledge. The fact is, with the current technology, with the resources, with the intelligence that we have, with the capabilities that we have, I think it's fair to conclude that we can have acted in a better way. And that what what happened was that a failure of, you know, of exercising the proper leadership. Now, this is not a statement, as I said, to blame. It's not a blame statement or to, you know, to spread despair, because this is not useful. Although I believe blame will happen, already we can see this happening and being politicized in many communities. If you watch the news from the United States, you can see it already has become uh, a subject for you know, uh, local politics and national politics and elections. And I think in many countries, especially democratic countries, especially countries with free press, um, this will become part of the political discourse and blame will take place. Uh, and I believe this is a dysfunctional uh, um, behavior. It will not help. It might score politically here and there in terms of local and petty politics, you know, power games, but we'll be wasting energy 
on, on, on simple stuff, while we should keep our energy to deal, to, to think about how do we learn from all of this and prepare ourselves from what might be coming next or for future uh, uh, such event. Because if it happens once, it will, it will happen again. At least we can save ourselves or maybe our children to go through the kind of trauma that we did, that we've been through. So um, definitely we should not go into blame, especially if you really think about it. If there is anybody to blame, it's ourselves at, you know, at a global level. In the end, blame is, you know, a responsibility is, goes to the individual level. So even if your head of state, if your government fails, if you really look deep, and maybe this is something hard to grasp, um, unless we think deep, deeply about it, if you think deep, part of responsibility is on the shoulders of everybody because it is you and I who elected these people. It's who you and I who are contributing to set the values of this society. So in the end, everybody is to blame. That's why it's not nice to go into uh, to that point. And definitely we should not blame the coronavirus because the virus is doing what the virus does. It does not mean harm. It does not mean it doesn't have, you know, um, um, bad intention. It doesn't want to create, to do, to be, to, uh, to be uh, an act, to create an act of evil against humanity. It's just doing what the virus uh, does. So blame does not help. But if we're speaking about leadership, how can we learn? How can we improve? How can we move forward if we don't have the courage? You now, as you know, we're passing the dangerous stage, and now we're going into you know gradually into the recovery mode. How can we, how can we learn if we don't have the courage to name things as they are, and in even in a bold way to assess our performance as a human race at all levels, with, with, the, with the sole purpose of learning. I mean, look at your reality. I mean, look at our reality. Five billion people locked down for weeks. Global economy frozen. We're talking about global recession and maybe depression soon. Tension between countries, you know, uh, panic in some cases, uh, disorientation. So if leadership is not about improving human condition, right, then what is it about? And if leadership is about improving human condition, then look at the human condition around us now as a manifestation of the kind of performance that we have exercised. Again, as I said, everything that I'm talking about is within the context of leadership. Anyway, let's put all that aside. Bottom line, uh, this is a serious leadership issue. That's the biggest problem that I see. It has the facade of a health issue. And I think if we frame it this way, then um, learning from this will take us much further than just thinking about vaccines and cures and ventilators and other aspects that can deal with the current uh, uh, problem, that, 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 you know, the day-to-day -day problem that we're facing. So let's talk about something deeper. The challenge that we have now, really, is a survival challenge. That's what the challenge we have. Um, partly physical survival, and that's going away. Uh, but mainly now, what's coming is the economic survival, and also survival at other levels. So we have a survival challenge, and we have a gross challenge that we have to um, deal with, because that's where our energy should go. And if we talk about leadership, that's where the emphasis is. How do we survive beyond just the health dimension? And how do we go back to the uh, growth mode that was happening you know, before this um, COVID-19 started, when the world was so excited about the economy moving you know, forward and forward and all jobs being created and we were all bullish about the prospects for the future. So leadership now is much needed so that we can win all these challenges at the personal level, at the family level, at the relational level, at the professional level, at the business level, at the social level, and even at the level of the human species. That's the real issue. So what do we do? Now let's move to the what do we do. What we do is, in my at least leadership understanding and the way I interpret leadership and the way my orienting philosophy is, we go to the first step, start with what matters most, and that is our purpose. What's our purpose? In this context, our purpose is to survive because we're living, dealing with a survival cha challenge and our purpose is to grow. So that's the purpose. 
When you go back to your business, to your job, your purpose will be how do you keep your job and how do you keep, go back to growing your job and your career. If you have a business, how do you keep your business and how do you go back to the growth mode of your business. So that's the main challenge. The same thing for a country, the same thing for the global economy. So that's the, the first challenge. The second step after defining clearly what's the name of the game, what's the purpose, is to ask the fundamental step of what is the nature of our reality? How has this reality changed? This is a huge question and it's still ambiguous. It's still unclear, it's still uncertain, it's still volatile. But still, even this is even a bigger reason to observe this and see how we're going to interpret this reality so that we can build the next step on this, all from a leadership perspective. So what's the purpose? And then what's our current reality? Obviously, our current reality has changed. And I'm sure that you have heard this many times. You have heard that, you know, there's going to be a new normal, a new norm. And you, haven't, you have heard that, we're going to, that the world will be different and that we're going into a different kind of reality. This is fine, but what does this really mean? I don't feel that this is still well, well understood. But why? Because we're just at the beginning of this. We're just at the exploration period of this. So how can leadership improve reality? That's the main task. How can leadership create a better reality in this context? This is the core leadership challenge. The core leadership challenge is how do we move from our current reality to a better reality? Because what's leadership? At core, leadership is about mobilizing people to successfully deal with their changing reality. Why? So that they can survive and thrive. The key words here are mobilization, are people, is successfully dealing with current reality and for a clear purpose and that's to survive and to grow. So what do we do? From a leadership perspective we have multiple levels of challenges. Number one challenge that we obviously have to deal with is challenge that comes from the health perspective. And here we have six different challenges that we need to deal with. Number one is to continue protecting people and limiting the damage that is happening to their health. We have done that successfully in some countries more than others, but at least we're on that path, we should continue this path. That's a one leadership challenge from the health perspective. The second one is, of course, find cures. And as I'm happy to hear, to know that there's so many companies, of course, logically speaking, are focused on finding, trying to find the cure. The third one is to find the vaccine also a work in progress. Fourth one is help poor nations. I cannot overemphasize enough this point, help poor nations. I am super worried, extremely worried from a leadership perspective about Africa. If you consider the healthcare uh, standards in Africa, and if you consider the, the viral nature of the way this pandemic is spreading, if this goes to Africa with you know, while considering how poor these countries are, I'm telling you, the number of casualties there will be shocking. And I feel that on a humanity's point of view, you know, at, a, at the scale of humanity, if we let this happen in Africa, then we should all be ashamed. Because we know what, 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 the, what, we know what this can do. And we've learned, at least from our own societies and communities, We've learned how to handle it, you know, by trial and error. So I feel now it's a moral obligation, at the same time social and political, uh, and you know, a global obligation to move on, you know, enough attention to Africa to help them, um, to help them overcome this. Because if we let Africa and poor countries handle this on their own, I mean, uh, the, 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 the implications are catastrophic. The fifth challenge we have on the health aspect is preparing for worst case scenarios. I was talking to some senior government official a few days ago and he was telling me about you know, secret sort of undeclared plans that they have in mind and they're preparing is that maybe the lockdown will be considered on and off will continue until December. They having serious considerations that this might come back in October or November as a second um, the second wave. There has always been an alarming, or there has also been an alarming report by WHO saying that humanity has to get used to dealing with 
you know, and living with uh, the coronavirus for the years to come, even after we do the virus, or at least until we do the virus. So we have to prepare for the worst case scenario that relates to the COVID. The sixth one is to prepare for the next pandemics. How? By introducing local and global protocols and plans so that when this happens, we are much, much better prepared uh, to deal with them, having learned from what is happening what, uh, now. We also have a huge economic challenge from a leadership perspective. And there are eight challenges, I believe, on that regard. Number one, we have to obviously restart the economy. Two, we have to reduce the economic damage right, that is happening now, especially on some sectors, you know, some segments of people uh, more than others. Um, number three, we have to help countries that are in debt. As I mentioned before, poor countries, African countries, they're barely uh, having to deal with um, finding sufficient resources just to pay their debts. So imagine now uh, their situation of having to find resources and money to upgrade their, to upgrade their uh, healthcare system. So that's another thing. We have to handle these countries that have major debt issues. Number four, we have to reduce the expected recession, to reduce the impact. Number five, we have to rethink about globalization. Because obviously, globalization has failed when it comes to this level, to this level from uh, in, in dealing with mega kind of, mega kind of problems of, uh, you know, at, at the level that happened. Number six, we have to rethink capitalism and see how we can further emphasize the importance of human beings. We're not just talking about human beings, about people in our, you know, in our website and corporate uh, literature, but actually acting as if people are really, really, really important. So we have to rethink about capitalism. Number seven, we have to redesign the supply chain to avoid uh, such future disruptions to the global economy. Number eight, we have to redefine trade agreements so that we don't have the kind of problems that happened uh, to trade when this crisis happened. Now, I'm going to talk about leadership challenge on the geopolitical level. There are also a number of leadership challenges there, at least five. First, number one fact is that before this COVID-19 thing started, international relations were already tense. In fact, many people say that there have never been, at least over the past, since the end of the Cold War, so much tension in international relations. So that's the starting point that we started when COVID-19 began. That's, that's the default, and that's an alarming issue. Number two, everybody's talking about a new world order. So the question is, what kind of new world, world order would this be? Uh, is it going to move in a worse, to a worse trajectory, or is it going to move to a better trajectory? And this is a dangerous game, if, because we can go either side. There are serious implications on both sides. If it's going to go into a worse situation with more tension, then you know, COVID-19 will, 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 will be a minor problem if you think about what could happen if the world goes into more you know, confrontations. We need to think about how do we go more towards cooperation than segmentation. And I can't overemphasize this enough. I believe, now leadership is a big word, personal, Michael Cooley, I believe the main keyword, the main buzzword, the absolute most important word that we should be teaching in the next, in this, the next decades and beyond as we go into the 21st century with such an interdependent and connected world is the word cooperation. That's the, that, I think that's what will save us. I think if we have to redefine leadership, we have to introduce the value of cooperation and collaboration as a major, major component into this. This is going to be a key element in the 21st century because we can't ignore and cancel each other. This has failed. We have history is full of attempts we've tried to cancel each other. What happened? More and more devastation. So it's about time that we understand this. There's no point of canceling each other. There's no point of unnecessary tension. We win more if we cooperate. I know this might sound idealistic, but it's not. It is actually a very smart strategy if you think from the, the concept of you know, political thinking and political strategies. We can't ignore and cancel each other. If we have to move from competition, well, competition that's aggressive, that's negative, into competing on how we can create more good that all of us can benefit from. Of course, 
I'm not naive and I'm, I'm, I'm realistic and I know how hard this is. That's why this is a leadership challenge. And I'm not talking about a scenario where we create heaven on earth, right? This is also unrealistic. But, but at least, I mean, what options do we have? Do we make things worse or better? Do we do things that harm us or things that benefit us, right? Things that help us. And I think we have to move into the other direction. Our countries have lots of problems already. If we pay attention to our countries, every country has poor people, every country has social issues. If we focus our energy instead of, of global tension, geopolitical tension, into using this energy to focus on our local problems, then I think each country will benefit more. We also have to deal with the issue of trust. This is a serious, serious issue. Trust. Why? I'll just give you an example. If there's another pandemic that starts in China, I'm just being hypothetical, and China says, China says, everything is under control. Let's say China is saying that. Don't worry, everything is under control. Would you trust China? That's a question. Would you trust China again? That's an issue of trust. If the EU says, we stand together as one, would you trust the EU? If you're Italy, would you trust the EU again? So we have to deal with the issue of trust that, happened, that, that, that came out after COVID-19. We also have to deal with the role of the United Nations and UN type organizations. We've heard uh, the reaction that happened to the decision by Donald Trump to freeze the US contribution to, uh, to the WHO. I'm happy he said freeze, and that's a smart statement to say because he didn't say cut. He's just saying freeze, and I'm guessing that what he means is let's look at these organizations before we start refunding them again. Now, I'm not going to go into the political element of this, but at least we have to think again about how do we enhance or make the role of the UN and other organizations that are in the same category more effective so that they can play an important, the important role that we expect them to do. I'm going to talk about now leadership challenges on the social level. All of these, you see, from a perspective of leadership, all of them are serious challenges. So we can't talk about leadership without talking about the challenges that come with that. Um, what we have now is a traumatized, what we have now is a traumatized humanity. That's what we have. And from a psychological and sociological point of view, this is a major issue. How are we going to deal with that? How are we going to deal with the social problems of unemployment that everybody is expecting. How are we going to deal with the problems that are happening in families? Um, you've heard reports that divorce rate is going up. I expect that suicide rate also would go, would go up as unemployment issues you know, unfold themselves and as we go into more recession and depression. So all of this needs to be handled at a government level. But not only government level, we need to help NGOs to take a bigger role in dealing with these problems that are a consequence of COVID-19 and the lack of leadership that we're talking about or the exposure of, you know, lack of leadership. So we need to help NGOs because states alone cannot handle this on their own. We need to protect divided societies from fragmentation. Many societies, some societies are homogeneous. Many other societies are heterogeneous. Even within, and they have internal tensions within them ethnic, religious, you know, um, economic, uh, uh, you name it, political, ideological tensions, and they are just making, you know, ever they're barely keeping themselves together, united. Um, even in countries that are more or less homogeneous, you can see also there are divisions, there are polarities uh, on the fabric of society. So how do we make sure that this mega stress that happened now to all societies uh, in, in many countries that will test the foundations of this society, will not rip it off and fragment this society. And that will create God knows of what kind of social, economic and maybe civil wars. So that's also another important social problem that from a leadership perspective we have to change, so we have to deal with. We also have to deal with the issue of the millennials and the new generation that is not just graduating from universities now and going to, the, to join the workforce. These people, unfortunately, bad luck, they're about to start their careers from uh, at a point where um, the global economy is suffering 
were about to start their career when unemployment is the main is the main title. We're, we're about to start their career when um, um, pessimism is more and more the space that is you know that's surrounding them. So what do we deal with this issue? With how do we deal with them? And we're talking about the future generation. You know, we're talking about millions of millions of people. So it's not only unemployment of those who are employed. So what do you do with the tens and hundreds of millions that are going to be thrown out into you know the job market? Uh, um, um, you know, f from scratch as their first step uh, after graduation from the universities. We also have to talk about fixing the culture of distrust that has happened since uh, COVID-19 because all our, you know, gestures, our social interactions, our isolations is based on distrust, distrusting the other. Now I'm going to talk about, as you can see, I'm keeping a high altitude perspective about the leadership challenges that we need to address uh, because you as an audience now, uh, you come from various backgrounds and also because the nature of the challenge is at multiple levels. So you can't handle one without taking care of the other one. These are all interwoven together, interrelated. If you ignore one at the expense of the other, you will have a problem that will pop up in the future and we can't do that. Um, so I'm going to move now talk about the leadership challenge from an organizational point of view. By the way, I'm going to be holding a webinar soon on this. Uh, the, 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 the title of the webinar is What to do when we go back to work? What's the first thing that we should do when we all go back to work, gradually? So that, and the subject of that, uh, the purpose of that webinar is to expand more and more about how do we uh, handle from a leadership perspective the recovery phase. But let me put this in short, let me tell you what I think about the leadership challenge from an organizational point of view. Number one, um, ask yourself, if you are a business entity, are your products or services still needed? Ask yourself this, number one. Number two, are they needed in the same way that they, needed, they were needed before, or they are needed in a different shape or form? Number three, are your clients still the same? If not, who are your new clients? Number four, what is your recovery plan during the upcoming recession and beyond? What are you going to do? These are all key, fundamental, valid questions. Are previous trends that were visible to you as you were strategizing for your business and for your industry, are they still vi viable? or they're diminished. Do they have, do, can you see new trends? Another point, which new trends are temporary and which new trends do you think will be staying? I mean, take out, let's consider this, you know, the, the webinars and the e-learning and all the conferences that are happening on using these kind of platforms. Of course, now they have peaked, but after we go back to work, um, they will go down, we will go back to normal. Of course, they will always now stay with us, but um, they, won't, they will lose the peak, the trend that you know, everybody is, is talking through through all these platforms of, uh, uh, of teleconferencing and video conferencing. Uh, this is a temporary thing, and with time it will calibrate itself with the new reality. So which one are staying and which one, uh, which one are temporary? Which new, uh, um, have you, uh, how are you going to adapt your structure considering all the above points that I have mentioned. Because if you're going to adapt, if you're going to change this new, new, new reality, this has to reflect in the structure of your organization. Can you maintain the same structure? Should it be more vertical? Should it be more horizontal? Do you need to eliminate some of the layers? All of these questions need to be answered. How are you going to manage your finances? How are you going to update your operational processes? How are you going to update your strategies, right, based on what's happening? Do these strategies still stand or you have to reconsider your strategy based on uh, the new reality, right? Now, if you, are, if you don't have a business and you're a professional, is your job still needed? Is it, will it be the same or will it uh, uh, transform itself in a different way? What new skills do you need to learn? What are the new skills that you need to learn? All of this, all of these questions, these are just some of the questions that all of us 
in the business community have to answer when we go back to uh, when we go back to work, and they constitute some of the main challenges that we have to approach from a leadership perspective. Why am I mentioning all of this? Because the answer to all of these challenges is exercising leadership. These challenges at a geopolitical, uh, health, social, um, um, business, you name it, will not be dealt with automatically by itself, by themselves. Somebody has to exercise leadership. You and I have to assume responsibility and exercise leadership. So there are macro challenges, but they all fit within the realm of what you have to do if you want to exercise leadership. Now I'm going to talk about a little bit about the personal element, as I promised you. And I need you to pay attention because some of the questions will be deep questions, but they're valid. And some of the questions will be hard. And I don't expect that you would have answer to these questions, but what I would urge you, what I would encourage you to do, is to start thinking about them. Because what a waste would be that, you know, all of this has happened and you haven't asked yourself fundamental questions, you haven't, you know, you haven't uh, reflected on what happened and, and you're going into a new reality that without being prepared. So I'm going to ask you some key personal questions that I really want you to suck in and see how you can reflect upon. Now, question, what are you doing to reduce the damage? of what's happening now on you personally, on you professionally, on your relationships, on your family and your loved ones. What are you doing to reduce that damage? Now, I would not ask you this question if we're not talking in the context of leadership. But if you want to assume leadership, if you want to exercise leadership, that's the first thing you have to do is how do I minimize damage on all these people around me and on my life from all this as perspective, the personal, the professional, the relational, the family, right, that, that I constitute my own sort of universe, my own orbit. What did you learn about yourself in all this time? Now we've been locked for six weeks or so, and we might be staying also for another few weeks. So what did you learn about yourself? Big question. If you were unhappy at work, now you're at home, so logically speaking, you should be happy. Are you happy that you're now away from work and you're at home? If you're not, if you're still unhappy, then maybe the reason of your unhappiness wasn't work. We have to think about these things. Why is this important? Because a major part of our life is work. So, what's your view about your work? If you were too busy before and because of work and you did not have time to spend uh, with the family, quality time, are you spending quality time now with your family or you're sitting at home, uh, social media and doing other stuff and avoiding uh, whatever it is to spend quality time with your family and loved ones? Because if that's the case, then that underlines a bigger issue. These are major questions if you want to approach yourself from a self-leadership perspective. What did you discover about yourself? Apart from whether you really liked work or not. Because that has been exposed now in the few weeks that we've sitting at home. Apart from... Uh, where you're not paying attention to your family because you were busy or because of other issues. Even now at home you're not paying attention. I mean quality attention, quality time. I'm not just saying being physically present. So in general, what's your level of satisfaction about your life? Were you happy before COVID-19? Were you happy? Are you looking forward to go back to life? Are you going, looking forward to going back to life again? the way it used to be? Or are you just fed up from staying at home and want to go back to your previous life regardless of how good or bad or satisfactory or unsatisfactory it was? If you reflected on all this, what's, what was missing in your life? What did you learn about what has been missing about your life in all these six weeks that have passed? 
Now, what can you do about all of that? What can you do about all of that? All the questions that I asked about, if you're talking about leadership. Another question, what kind of life would you like to have? Now that you have seen how your life was before, and you have enough time to reflect and think about it sitting at home, and everybody's talking about that things will change. Okay, in this new reality that's coming now, what kind of life would you like to have in this coming reality? Because now you have the time to think about it and strategize and design that. What kind of relationships you want to have for the rest of your life? At least for the coming years. What kind of social life or friends do you want to have? What kind of a professional life would you like to have? These are fundamental questions, fundamental self-leadership questions that you should really think about because they are core questions. That is provided, of course, uh, you are really ready to go that deep and ask yourself all these questions. Again, from the context of leadership, you have to do that. What can you, to, to, what can you do to start creating the life that you really want? Now that you have seen how fragile life is, now it's obvious to all of us that the only difference between you and me and the people who died in the, you know, in the ICUs and the people who done, did not make it is pure luck, just pure, absolute pure luck that they were in the vicinity of people who had the virus and they were infected and they ended up in the ICU and not making it. So you and I are alive not because we're great people, we're super people, we're just lucky. So knowing this now, as part of you know, a wake-up call to our reality. How do you want to handle this? And what do you want to do to create the kind of life that really you really want, knowing how precious and vulnerable and fragile and volatile and unpredictable life is? All of these points need to, deal, to be dealt with because this is the purpose of, re of leadership, is to create a better reality. Because without good leadership, right, it's not that we just will fail in facing these challenges, right? These challenges will not go away and it will become much, much better. Now, I'm going to go, and this is about, I'm going to go into the final part of uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, conversation, this, this webinar, um, is um, what kind of leadership is needed? I'm going to talk about leadership traits. What kind of leadership is needed to handle these, all of these challenges that we talked about. Because what I've said so far is that we have a major leadership issue. This is a health issue from the, from the surface, but inside it's a leadership issue and it has exposed all our weaknesses and vulnerabilities. And we talk about these different level of challenges, including the personal one. Now, what kind of leadership traits, right? What kind of leadership characteristics should you and I have so that we can handle all of this. Of course, this depends on the context that we talk about because what you need to mobilize yourself is different than what you need to mobilize individuals. It's different than what you need to mobilize organizations or nations or the international community. But there are common traits that I would like to talk about in the end, at the end of this, of this uh, webinar. First one, I want to talk about the very important fundamental trait of leadership is courage. Without courage, don't even bother talk about leadership. Because leadership is about dealing with the difficult realities. So how can you even think about exercising leadership and deal with all the challenges, the mega challenges that I have been elaborating upon, if you don't have courage? How can you have, where can you get the power, the strength to make bold decisions without courage? So definitely you have to have courage to deal with shaping the future reality that you want to live in. The second one is truth. How can you deal with reality if you can't name things the way they are? I cannot, I cannot stress more the importance of truth. If you don't make truth a fundamental element of the way you exercise leadership, my friends, then you're living in an illusion and you're making everybody else also live in an illusion. Right? So how can you make truth as an important part of your uh, leadership philosophy from leadership practice. Number three is dealing with core causes. And here comes to framing the issue. In the science of leadership, it's very important to frame the issues properly. 
because if you don't frame the issues properly, then you haven't diagnosed the problem properly. Then you're dealing with the wrong problem. You are, when you get the diagnosis wrong, then everything that comes after that is built on something that's wrong. So it further complicates the problem. So how can you deal with the core issues by framing them in the right way? That's why truth and courage are super important. Another aspect is taking responsibility because responsibility is at the core of what leadership is about. It's to say that although this is not my fault, I have nothing to do with this, right? This is not, I'm not accountable for this, but I take it on as my personal responsibility to do something that I can do to mobilize in the direction of making things better. The, another point, leadership is about turning chaos into order. It's about creating new processes to do that. Now, you've seen, we were in a certain stage of equilibrium before this started. We were in such a state of balance. We suddenly moved into a state of disequilibrium. So the question is, how do you bring back order into this? And for that, you need to create new processes that can adapt to the new reality. How can you think inclusively, right? Leadership now, it will require an inclusive perspective because we've discovered how interdependent and how connected we are. Without an inclusive mindset in terms of, you know, in, um, taking into effect and listening to all people around you, especially people who are part of your circle where you want to exercise leadership, how can you be effective in doing that? What kind, now, um, now what about um, um, petty politics and, 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 and petty matters? I tell you now. As you will see now, in, if you look at the global perspective, uh, if you look at, look at what's happening, what's going to happen in your country at a you know, local level, you will start seeing after this is over, political parties you know, and oppositions and government and authority, all of these starting, as I said before, trying to exchange blame so that they can score against each other. You don't have time for petty matters and for silly politics it will drain, drain your energy. You need to put all your energy on how you adapt so that you can move forward. Another point is collaborative thinking. As you saw, government took an authoritarian style right, in exercising their leadership and in exercising their role to, to, to handle a crisis. And that's the right thing to do. But you can't continue this for a long time. From now on, after we finish this crisis, you have to move into a collaborative state of thinking. You have to move into a collaborative style of leadership because the, the crisis is over. So you have to sit with others and talk to them. And to do that, you have to be flexible. You can't be stubborn and exercise leadership in a dynamic situation. You have to test assumptions, assumptions of the past. Where my interpretation, assumptions around the past, were they correct? Were they accurate? Where my, are my assumptions about the present also accurate? Are my assumptions about the future also accurate? Because wrong assumptions, wrong interpretations, wrong diagnosis, then wrong actions, and then problems became, become worse. So we have to consider all of these assumptions. I'll just give you a small example. You know, most of the world went into the strategy of mitigation you know, when it comes to controlling the coronavirus effect. Sweden chose another model. They went into the term that is called, quote unquote, herd. Uh, approach the uh, herd immunity where they just allow people to interact and the virus to flow naturally until the community develops its own immune system now and it was controversial so we have to you know reconsider this approach and how can you do that if you don't have a flexible mindset that can look at these different perspectives and ask yourself which one makes sense which assumption proves to be better than others another point is is to um, to, 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 to emphasize that you cannot go into the future when there's so much movement around you, so, many, so much volatility with big ego. Ego kills. And you have to acknowledge that you don't know all the answers. You don't know. No matter how genius you are, your IQ is 170, 120, it doesn't matter. It does not matter. Nobody can predict this. So you have to put your ego aside and acknowledge that you don't have all the answers. You have to have the courage to improvise as much as you can because we're going into unknown territory. So nobody can tell you from past experience, I know what to do. You don't know what to do because nobody has past experience 
to compare to what happened. So you have to improvise and experiment. You know, small things that if succeeded, then you can scale them up. If they didn't succeed, the cost is low, you move to experimenting something else. And that takes courage because there will be cost involved. You need to connect with people. You need to connect with people because how you mobilize, how can you mobilize people if you don't connect with them properly? You need to encourage diversity of thoughts, diversity of approach, so that you make sure that you're not missing any point and you are incorporating and building and integrate, integrating into your thinking the experience of everybody around you because we were all in this together and you need to be a great, 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 great listener. Of course, you need to have to, 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 have to know how to mobilize, you need to have the techniques of mobilization, and that's an art by itself. And you need to know how to build trust with the people around you, whether they were your team, whether they are your clients, whether they are your constituencies, whether it's the market. Trust is essential to build these connections and to move forward. And you need to understand that it's going to be a message. It's not going to be a clean, you know, hygiene operation. It's going to be super messy because when you do experimentation, when you do improvisation, there will be failure, and that failure will create mess. So we will go through a messy stage until we go back to a stage of equilibrium and stability. Think about the hurricane. After the hurricane, it's completely messy, so we need to clean up and start all over again and learn how to, you know, how to apply new thinking and build a stronger foundation for, you know, for the next hurricane. The last three points I want to mention is encouragement because people need to be encouraged. People are tired, traumatized, uh, lost, um, scared. Uh, they don't know what to do. Uh, they're looking for signals. So you need to encourage them, encourage them, encourage them. Even when you don't know the answer, encourage them and make sure that they are partners with you in finding the answers and the solution. You need to observe and act. Then observe again then based on that observation make corrections then act again then observe so you need to oscillate and alternate between a state of observation into a state of intervention then a state of another observation and interpretation right then you do corrections then you make another interpretation and then you go the cycle continues until you get it right and and the last point and the most important point is you have to have faith and hope that you and people around you will get over this. Whatever is the damage, depression, recession, you name it. Listen, we have the technology. We have the intellectual resources. We have people who are ready to work. We have the expertise. We have the willingness to go back to work. We have the energy to go back to, you know, reconstructing life. So, in my mind, all the components of going back to life as it used to be, and even better, are there. And I'm reminded by these beautiful pictures and videos that I see sometimes on how animals are going back to cities. I'm sure you've seen them on social media, how tigers, birds, animals, deer are going back, you know, they're coming out of their forest and going back to cities in no times, in just, you know, they've been away for years and years and maybe decades. It took them just two or three weeks to go back um, and expand their, 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 their horizon and expand their scope of living and they expand their territories and go back to cities. So that shows about the, 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 um, the amazing um, quality of resilience that all of us have. So that's going to be a major important component in you and I spreading hope around us. Spreading hope based on the face that we are, uh, we are strong, that we've made it so far, and that we can learn, and that we have by default the ability to learn and to adapt, right? And to, and to want more, and to seek more. And to, by default, we have the ability to, to grow, and to heal, and to forget. So all of these components give us hope that we have everything it takes, everything it takes to exercise beautiful and brilliant leadership so that not only we can get our life back, but we can build a much, 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 much better reality. And this is the core of leadership. That's great. Thank you so much, Michael. Is it time to take a couple of questions? Um, I'm ready. Go ahead and shoot. Okay. Um, 
So we'll start with the first one. Uh, the question is two parts actually. The first part is saying at the micro level, which is the moderate size company level, how do you see the role of leadership and do they need to change the leadership style in pandemic and beyond? The next question is uh, leaders might also be facing a threat of job security in the current situation. How can they show empathy to their subordinates? Okay, so the first question is, how do we exercise leadership at a small level in this environment, correct? Yeah. Well, the fundamentals uh, are the same. The fundamentals are the same. But regardless of the scale that we're talking about, I mean, if you're leading a state or if you're leading a small team, the fundamentals are the same. What's the purpose? What's our purpose of being here? Why are we here? That's the fundamental question. That's the most existential question. And I believe that this has not changed. The crisis that happened did not change the issue of our purpose. The second one. So whatever you're doing, if you're in the hotel business, if you're in the aviation business, if you're, so your purpose is clear. Your, your purpose is to move people or to provide people with a place to stay. If you are a finance person, then your purpose is to provide your company with you know, the best uh, management of you know, finances so that uh, you can help the company grow. If you're in HR, then your purpose is to grow and manage and develop the human capital of the organization. So it doesn't matter where you are. There is a purpose that justifies your existence. And it's most likely that this purpose has stayed. So what you need to do, my friend, is to, starting with this purpose, ask yourself the following question. Now, in what way has, new, has reality changed so that we can adapt ourselves to fulfill our purpose, right, based on the new reality? Just like we've adapted now to holding this talk, this webinar, using this technology, and fulfilling the purpose of leadership, a sort of education and of, you know, of learning. In the same way, you have to ask yourself, what is the nature of my current reality? How is the world changing? Keep an eye on the world. Ask people as much as you can. Collect as much data as you can. Ask your team. Ask your colleagues. Ask everybody who is part of your universe. Ask them. Do not make decisions yet because you do not know. Just ask. Keep asking until you're tired. And when you're tired, ask again and again and again. And make sure to ask people from so many different perspectives. And by the time you do that, subconsciously, you would have collected enough information to start making wise decisions. So once you've, you have clear on your, you're clear on your purpose, and once you, are, you have clarity on things, how things have changed, especially in terms of how your client, how your customers, whether local or external, internal without the company or external, want you to serve them, then all what you do, you need to do now, is to go through the process of adaptation so that you can continue to provide similar services or modified services right, to the same clients in the way that they want it now. That's why I said you have to be flexible. Now, once you have a good understanding of this, and you try to formulate a new vision of this, then it becomes the process of mobilization. How do you mobilize your people so that they become part of this endeavor, part of this journey, and collectively together, you and them, because you can't do it alone. I don't care who you are, you cannot do it alone. Nobody can do it alone. The head of a country can do it alone. How can you work together as a group, whether it's a small group or it's the largest, you know, several hundred thousand a strong company? It doesn't matter. How can you work together so that each from his or her perspective acquire the new skills, develop their new capabilities, you know, adapt themselves together in harmony so that you collectively as a team, as a department, as an organization, adapt to this new reality and reposition yourself in a way that would satisfy the needs of your client. Because in the end, what what, what justifies your presence is your ability to satisfy the needs of your clients, internally or externally. Now, their needs have changed, if it has changed. If you find your ways of mobilizing your team to change their techniques, to change their approach, so that they can keep satisfying this need, then fine. I mean, look at the construction business. Now, maybe, let's say, people don't have money. They want maybe smaller houses. Fine, then adjust yourself, you know, the way you do, to 
to, to adapt to this new need that people don't want villas now, they don't want you know, 50 story towers, maybe they're looking for smaller projects. So adjust yourself to this need. Same thing for you know any other. It's, listen, the world has not changed. We, when we get out of this, we'll still be the same people. We have the same need. We're going to sleep, we'll need shelter, we'll need food, we'll need transportation. So nothing really has changed. So just monitor how has this modified itself and then modify yourself accordingly. And for this you need to mobilize. That's why leadership is important because the core of leadership is mobilization. But first, have visibility of what you want to do, clarity, and then start experimenting. As I said, experimenting and know that you will not succeed from the first time. Just stay together as a team, make it a group challenge and make yourself and them realistic about that it will take us time until we improvise, experiment, try new things. And eventually, you'll get it right. So, you've done it before and you'll do it again. There's no worry about that. Just keep your focus on what the clients want and on adapting and it's fine. So, we have a question here. How do you choose between business survival and leadership? Like, how many to let go uh, how many employees to let go in the name of business? And does survival of business make you a bad leader for making these decisions? Okay, um, I think this also relates to the previous second question that you asked. So you're saying, what does leadership mean in the context of that? You have to do whatever you have to do to make sure that your yes. business survives. Now, as I said, um, courage, you have to take the bold decisions, even if the bold decision means you have to keep your clients, sorry, your staff. I don't know what are the details of your business. In some cases, you might have to bite the bullet and say it's going to cost me more, but for the sake of my brand, for the sake of the way the world sees me, my reputation, right, in the market that I've been building for years, it's important that I sacrifice little money and keep my staff. In some cases, you might do it regardless of the brand because of your own personal values that you don't let go of your people in these difficult times. Uh, in some other cases, it might be that you might have to actually let go of some of your people. So maybe you can find ways of reallocating them. Maybe you can find ways if you, can, you found new opportunities to do the business, right? Maybe now, let's say the delivery business now has increased. Maybe you can move people more into the delivery department. So you have to see, find ways of minimizing this damage to them. Now, after you've tried everything and you found that there's absolutely no way but to, uh, but to uh, take the, the hard decisions and make sure that, um, that you have to let go of some people so that the business survives, then you have to do that then, I mean, what can I tell you? It's hard. Some people lost their lives. Maybe you're in time. I mean, the choices are some people leave and or everybody leaves. Maybe you can find a way that this is a temporary thing. Maybe give them part of their salary, maybe a small part. Maybe you will change the scheme to make it more, I don't know, you make them partners, you give them share, whatever. So what I'm saying is, listen, a scenario where this is going to be easy doesn't exist. This is not going to be easy. So you have to do it with the minimum possible damage by going back to your values. See what matters most to you and do what you think is right. But before you do that, ask people, ask for advice, consult with people. And then when you see that there's no other choice, even if it was hard and painful, then do that. And maybe in the future, you might have a chance to further employ their people. These people bring them back, you know, expand, who knows. But there's no escaping from paying some kind of price for survival because survival is not easy especially when you have a threat at this level you know physical threat and economic threat and with this unprecedented magnitude and sometimes now let's go back to the second part of the question what do you do if you, your job itself is in danger well what do you do you do the same thing what's the what's the nature of your reality my job is in danger so what do i do I think about, okay, how can I reinvent my job so that I can position myself in the new reality? Okay, they tell me, listen, we don't need you anymore. And maybe you do your homework and you say, but you will need somebody to do this and this and this and this. So maybe if you give me some time until I can build up these skills and I can 
you know, play a different role that would fit your new requirement. Or you can say, you know, give me some times until I, uh, or give me opportunities where I go and learn by myself on how to develop these skills. So you have to find ways of adapting yourself to this new situation. Now, is it guaranteed that you will succeed? It's not guaranteed that you will succeed. But that's the weight of leadership. That's the weight of leadership that, uh, just like the doctors, I mean, think about the doctors. Even when they think that they, are, they might lose their life, that they might actually get it, and it's not their fault, but because of the requirement, the sense of responsibility, the meaning that their job is giving them, they still put themselves in danger and uh, help and do their best to cure the sick people. So that's part of the job. That's the burden of being, of exercising leadership. You have to carry your own burden, and with that you have to carry the burden of others. Is it easy? It's not going to be easy. But welcome to the universe of leadership. That's why leadership is so rare, because you have to take on not only your pains, but the pains of everybody else around you, and it's going to be messy, and nobody's going to be happy, and sometimes you will end up becoming a victim or you'll pay the price. But if you do your best to adapt, and if you have faith in your own ability, if you are flexible enough and adaptive enough to adjust yourself to what the new reality demands, then through adaptation, you will find also a new place for you, the same way you found a place for you in the past. History will not end this. This is just a difficult time, and it's a challenge that we will overcome, and sooner or later, the world will come back to its feet and will be running again in the direction of growth. I am optimistic over the long term. So hold on, do your best, and whatever it is, adapt and have faith in your internal strength. I'm sure you will overcome. Good. Can we have two more questions? And one is related to the optimism. Um, the question says, what are the opportunities that you see post-COVID-19? Uh, well, it depends. First opportunity is to learn. That's the first opportunity. You have, you know, once in, I hope, I hope once in a lifetime, I mean, people say that this has never happened uh, for, you know, centuries. So this you have once in a lifetime to learn at this mega level. So learn, that's number one. The second thing is all the points that I talked about exercising personal leadership, right, on the personal level, ask yourself, have the courage to stay in silence and ask yourself these fundamental questions about asking yourself, you know, how can I position myself to create a better reality for my life? Because it will be such a waste that you go into, you know, this happened and you haven't really learned about what you want from life and how do you want to re redesign your life, reorient your life in the way that will make that uh, wish, that desire, that aspiration of a different reality, of a new life for you, a different life, a better life, a reality. So that's another opportunity. Now, when it comes to the job or the business level, again, it depends on the industry. Some jobs will disappear. I don't think many jobs will disappear. But may, all jobs will have to evolve themselves, right? And there will be opportunities. If anybody can tell you they know now, I don't think they, they I mean, I don't think they're accurate. Maybe in some cases, yes. Uh, but in most cases, you still have to observe. Observe, observe, observe. But will there be opportunities? Yes, there will be opportunities. And the logic is really simple. You have almost 8 billion people. These people are going to eat, drink, and sleep, you know, and travel, and find jobs, and put food on the table, and interact, and, and, and connect every single day. So it's not that, you know, we have, we're different. We're the same species. We have the same needs. So it's just that the way these, these are, um, these will uh, uh, appear themselves, these will manifest themselves, will change. So observe that, and find opportunities. Just find the opportunities. Um, and maybe we talk about entrepreneurship. If you really want to be an entrepreneur, that's the right time for entrepreneurship. In fact, after this is over, it's going to be the peak time for entrepreneurship because there are going to be, you know, endless opportunities of picking up new ideas and doing new things. So if you want to be an entrepreneur, you don't have to be a business entrepreneur. You can be, you know, a personal entrepreneur in terms of you know, being an entrepreneur about enhancing your life. Just watch what's happening around you 
and find opportunities. But you can't do that by being close-minded. You can't do that by not asking, by not talking, by not observing, by not watching what's happening, observing people's behavior. When the market's open, you know, go to the market and see how things have changed. So when you do that, there are plenty, plenty of opportunities. I can't give you specific examples because you have to tell me what industry you're talking about, but whatever it is, there are opportunities. Today I heard that, you know, Virgin Atlantic or, you know, Virgin Australia is about, you know, I think they're declaring bankruptcy. Now, for them it's bad news, but for another company, maybe it's an opportunity to acquire them. So you never know when the situation is so dynamic, when everything is up in the air, right? Things might fall on their faces, but also things might fall standing, and that offers opportunities. So keep an eye, remain entrepreneurial, get ready to take some, some risks, um, experiment, and, uh, and try some things. Give yourself some tolerance to failure, take some risks, and I'm sure, I'm sure you will find opportunities. I am not worried. I am not worried, because all the elements of adaptation are already built in without you. If you are listening, listen, if you are listening to this webinar, I don't know how old you are, how old you are. You might be 25, 26, or 65, or 75, it doesn't matter. Even if you're 25, or 18, or 19, you have, my friend, you've made it so far, you've made it. Now, you didn't have COVID-19 threats, right, at the global level to deal with, but I, I assure you, or I am confident that you had your share of dealing with adversities, dealing with, with setbacks, dealing with pain and suffering and shocks and disappointment. You had your share. Otherwise, how would you have survived life so far? Because the nature of life is problems. I mean, life is beautiful in many ways, but it also has, it's full of challenges, right? It's a journey of challenges. It's, it's about suffering and pain and adversities and overcoming them, right? So that's the bad news. Now, the good news, the bad news is that life is about pain and suffering. But that's half the story. In fact, it's 40%. 60% of the story is that you have everything it, that it takes for you to overcome. And I'm not giving you just Pepto. Why? Because just look at your life and recite the number of challenges that you have faced, health-wise, relationship-wise, family-wise, professional-wise, business-wise. You know, you just name it. I'm sure you had your share, maybe some more than others, and you've overcome. So this is just another one. So be strong, learn from what happened, and have no fear. Have no fear. This is the most important leadership statement. Have no fear. Whatever it is, just increase your tolerance to pain, increase your tolerance to experimentation, try things, you fall your face on your face a few times, but have no fear. I guarantee you, you will make it because you're made for resilience, you're made for strength. So capitalize on that. Okay, uh, so we only have a few minutes left and uh, we have so many questions, but I'll, I'll select a few. So one of the questions uh, is asking you, you mentioned that you were worried about the situation in Africa. So uh, what is your advice to uh, the African people and what do you think that leaders in Africa should do different, different things? Well, um, I hope they're observing what's happening and I hope they have used all this time uh, to get ready because one of the main issues in European and other countries was when people were not ready fast enough. Well, if I'm an African president um, with very little amount of you know, infections in my country watching what's happening, then I've had plenty of time to prepare. So, so number one, I've heard that they have, I hope they've had enough time to prepare. That's number one. Number two, I hope that they've had enough strength um, and determination to ask for help. Now, I've heard also that the IMF has allocated billions of dollars to help these countries. And that's a beautiful thing. You see, that's why I have hope in humanity, because we've messed up, we mess up in so many fronts, but we also have a beautiful side. You know, we have a beautiful side to our to our to our to our nature as humans, and some of us do it right, and some of us think long term, and and uh, uh, we're benevolent. You know, we're 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 good. There's a good part to us. So these things are available. So have the strength to nag and go and insist and knock on every possible door, and to get ready. 
Um, and so many people now are talking about having overstaffed themselves with all this, you know, hospital beds, and they built extra hospitals that ended up not needing uh, ventilators, you name it. And I also heard that a number of companies will start, in fact, the production of the ventilators, they will come to the market in maybe end of May, June, July. So, and, and I feel that after a few months or in a few weeks' time, we will end up with an abundance of so many of these, you know, beds and hospitals and ventilators that we don't know what to do with. Because, because the numbers are promising, right? the, the number of cash, you know, uh, infections and deaths are going down. So there's so many empty beds and empty ventilators and other equipment and medications are sitting around. So if I'm an African leader, I mean, just be on the phone all the day, day and night. Make sure that you knock at every single door and ask for every possible help that you can. You know, go to wherever you can. Because when this hits you, you don't want to be in a position where it goes exponential and you're not ready. So I hope, Mr. African leader, you've used all this time to get ready because it's coming to you. That's the nature of the, 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 the virus. When airports start opening, this is going to spread again. And if it spreads again, whatever is left of it, if it goes to Africa, God help them, you know? I mean, it will be, people will, 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 will suffer there in, you know, in life in a horrible way. Theoretically, I hope it doesn't happen. I really hope it doesn't happen. I hope that, you know, that the news that this will die by itself in a few weeks' time is true. I hope it doesn't, it doesn't happen. Uh, but uh, just in case, because your job is to prepare for worst case scenarios, get ready. Get ready, get every possible help that we can. And sometimes the only strength that we have is to ask for help. So use that strength, shout, and get every possible help that you can. Learn from other people and be ready. Um, and let me tell you something, if you're Mr. African leader, if you're, uh, if you're listening. Uh, the world is busy now. It's busy with its own problems. And that's fair because everybody has their own you know, challenges to deal with. But it's okay, it doesn't matter. Keep knocking at the door. Keep knocking at the door. Because, I'll tell you why, in, in, in most of the modern countries, at least the minimum was there to handle, at least, you know, in a reasonable way, some of these, some of these casualties. The minimum was there. Uh, but in, uh, in, uh, in African places, the number of doctors, in some of, countries, some of the countries, the number of doctors, the ratio of doctors to the population is, uh, I mean, shockingly low. The number of hospital beds, shockingly low. The number of equipment, again. So, so, so it's really emergency there. And guess what? If the, if the world leaders, quote-unquote leaders, especially rich people, are smart, they would really give this a priority as well, because if it spreads in Africa and all these, you know, airports are open and you're back in business, somewhere or form it will find its way directly or indirectly back to your country. And you don't really want a second wave. You don't want that to do that. that. You don't want that. So, and, you know, because of migration and immigration, African people are all over the place, in America, in Africa, in Europe, I mean, you name it. The world now is all mixed. So will the virus find itself to go back to Europe and the States and develop a country? Yes. So it's the core interest of these rich people, rich countries, rich states, to take care of their neighbors, of the poor countries, not only because of you know doing something good, which is fine, that's valid by itself, but also to do what? Is to make sure that this doesn't come back to us as a second wave, as people are talking about. But it's the responsibility is on African people. So shout, prepare, and I mean, 24 hours, don't even sleep. Because, I mean, I'm being metaphorical, because uh, it is serious. And if, if look what happened to Italy, France, Germany, United States, you are no way near there in terms of infrastructure. And, uh, and the way people are together, I mean, imagine social distancing or physical distancing in Africa. Imagine in, this, in the slums of Africa. We're talking about, you know, apocalyptic scenarios. So it's the responsibility of the world not to, for this to happen. If this happens, I'm telling you, I, Michael Cooley, I'm telling you, I'd be ashamed of being a human being because I saw, I'm seeing it's happening as a human, I'm, talking, I'm using myself, as a sample human. I'm seeing this is happening and 
we're not doing anything about it. And that's a mo that would be a moral failure. But again, I'm optimistic because there might be a dark side to, to people, but there's always a bright side to people as well, and we should, we should build on that. focus on being optimistic uh, and hoping for the best scenarios to happen. Um, we have exceeded the time limit. Uh, we have so many questions and I'm so sorry that we're not able to answer them all. Um, we are 30 minutes over time, but that's fine. If you have any questions that would like to reach out to Michael directly, he's available on LinkedIn and he's got his website www.michaelcooley.com. Reach out to him directly. Um, and if you have any questions, you may also email us and we will be happy to connect with you. You can, also connect you, with me. you can also connect with me through social media, Instagram and Facebook, and send me your questions. There's also my other website, it's called cooleinstitute.com, and you can email me there. And if there's anything I can do to help you in answering your questions, I'm more than happy to do that. I keep following, because soon I think we'll do a Q&A question open for the public on all you know, social media platforms. So if you would like to join, I'll be more than happy. Just, it will be dedicated to Q&A. I'll be more than happy to ask you to answer your questions as well. That's great. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you all for uh, attending this uh, webinar, for taking the time to listen to Michael and to, uh, to listen to us. Uh, thank you for the questions. Stay tuned to more webinars coming up uh, soon and uh, keep following our social media platforms, uh, the University of Manchester Middle East Center on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Thank you all, thank you, Michael, and have a great evening, everyone. Thank you, everyone. stay safe, Good stay day. safe, have hope, and exercise leadership. That's the time for leadership. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank, thank you for Absolutely. your attention, thank, thank you. Thank you so much, thanks, take care. Thank you.